Ms. Tobiana, what is the definition of a successful Paris Agreement? What does it need to include? The, the success we are looking for, for Paris is the message, a strong signal that the low carbon economy is underway, is inevitable and profitable and desirable. So we, the criteria for Paris is the conviction that every actor will have on the 12th of December that this is going to happen. And this is, of course, about an agreement that sets the rule for a long time, uh, clear, with mechanism of a, a long-term goal that everybody can understand as a direction of travel, um, mechanism of uh, reviewing the different national efforts uh, and upgrading them and upscaling them of the, over time, and a mechanism creating transparency and trust on the action of everyone. And, of course, it has to include a sense of how finance can help this process to, to go, and, uh, and in a way recognizing as well the action and the uh, capacity of uh, many actors and not only the government. So countries have all, already agreed on one long-term goal, namely limiting warming to no more than two degrees for, uh, Celsius from pre-industrial times. But is, that, is, is it going to be enough to just have that goal in the agreement, do you think? <coughs> well, it's very important anyway to reaffirm it as a, not a declaration or a decision of the COP Cancun was. It's an agreement. It's a legally binding agreement. So I think it's, again, a very important step to have this back. In, in the agreement. Then, of course, we, tr we should try to explain, to translate this goal in a more concrete term. Will it be low carbon economy? Will it be decarbonization? I don't know. The way the negotiations have been going, it's very clear that the emissions cuts that countries are going to offer are going to be voluntary. How can we be sure that they will in fact be as long lasting and will in fact be achieved? We have to have in the, in the agreement a mechanism that can be uh, the one that measures the performance as a transparency issue. And the second element is that over time they have to improve, so to get, of course, consistent with science. And uh, as well, and I think that is a complementary element a review, a collective review that again measures the performance of countries against science and then design the next steps, the next ladders we have to climb. And what's this likely to mean for companies and specifically I'm thinking of big fossil fuel companies like Shell or ExxonMobil? The notion that they have to think about their future a little differently and, uh, and we saw already countries saying, even oil-based countries saying we have to diversify the economy and uh, uh, we have to depend on other source of wealth for the future. So that this transition, this orderly transition we are talking about. And I think for the oil company as a participation in this movement, I think some of them have already taken this into account. For example, factoring in carbon pricing for their own activity, thinking about their diversification in renewable energy, for example. So uh, if the economy signal is there, if the policy signal is clear, I think the companies will adapt. But what we hope is that they will show the, the way as well. And just finally, um, I mean, this, this agreement is ultimately about reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And yet uh, we know that uh, part of the reason it's so difficult to, to forge an agreement, to finalise an agreement, is because there's so much concern about the amount of money that wealthy countries are going to be able to channel to poorer countries. Can you explain why that is? Many countries of Africa, small islands, will suffer net losses, sometimes very huge losses because of climate change where, where they are not responsible for. So the notion that there is a, somehow a solidarity between the ones who polluted more and the ones who are suffering more is, is quite logical. And so that's one element. The second element is, I think nowadays, all developing countries envisage their development future, so the growth model as somehow different from what the ones were, they were dominant before. And this, is, this has a cost, even if finally, if the technology are there, if the deployment of this low carbon economy is really um, running, then the cost of this change will, of course, diminish dramatically. But still, you need this support of the financial system to this transition, and, and again, today, the financial system is, is um, finally more supportive of the high carbon economies and the low carbon economies. That's the, the shift we have to make. <laughs>